dynamical systems, qualitative methods for nonlinear differential equations. Certainly you don't need to look at all these books, but they're all helpful in different ways. So what's a singularity? A singularity of electric potential of a conductor placed uniform electric field has these dipole looking singularities inside the conductor. We can think of them as image charges, just so that we get the right binary condition for the field out here. But a singularity more generally doesn't have to be something bad. In fact, here's physical, and it could also just mean equilibrium point. So this is what we mean by dynamical system. The vector field specifies the system of first order component ODEs in the sense that x dot time derivative equals matrix times x. The formal solution of this equation is just x is e to the at x zero. So if you plug this to equal to zero, then you will stay at zero, as you could have read off from this equation. The integral curves of this ODE gives a flow phi t of x zero. So if you specify initial condition, you have some flow, and this word in mathematics is borrowed from fluid dynamics, which we'll return to in a little bit. Now you can prove theorems about this. One key theorem is Frobenius theorem, that says that if you have a tangent space to some possibly curved space, then you get this integral of curves if the vector field satisfy this condition. And the condition essentially means that the commutators of vector fields are spanned by the vector fields themselves. If you're familiar with Lie algebra, just a warning that the structure constants here could be over functions and not just constants. It would be great to understand this eventually, but we want to first just get some, some rough idea of what a dynamical system is. Here we're doing qualitative analysis, we're not solving exact equations. Usually we imagine taking an energy functional and doing a second order approximation, which means we do a linear approximation in the equations we're actually trying to solve. We can study eigenvalues of the Hessian, which is the matrix of second derivatives. So this is like the min-max test, where you check the second derivative to see if you're maximum or minimum, or maybe a saddle point. You can use this actually in vibration analysis. Engineers talk about eigenvalues of some dynamical system, like in a paper making machine, it will vibrate a lot if you didn't understand the qualitative analysis of your dynamical system, which is the paper machine. A bridge is similarly dynamical, even though it might seem rigid to you, it's dynamical to an engineer. People who build skyscrapers sometimes put hundreds of thousands of liters of water in them to try to offset any possible wobble due to, for example, wind. So these are all dynamical systems, and we'll get back to some more examples later. First, a few things that can happen, just to illustrate what we mean by these qualitative features. You can have angular momentum stabilization of a dynamical system, meaning you have a conserved quantity, in this case, angular momentum, which is something like mass times radius times velocity. This is very clear in the effective potential approach to classical mechanics, such as the Kepler orbits. I have these maple files, if you're interested, to compute Kepler orbits around a central planet or a star. Geodesics on a minimal surface is another good example. This is a model of a wormhole, but it's really just locally a catenoid, a minimal surface. If you're coming in fast with a lot of rotation, so to speak, around this point, you're not going to be able to get through the wormhole, you're going to spiral back out. So you're going to bounce off of the wormhole because you didn't manage to get through this neck. Another thing that you may not think would happen in a simple system like this is you can have bifurcation. This is called a pitchfork for obvious reasons. This might confuse you because you thought you had uniqueness for ordinary differential equations, so how could there be this apparent non-uniqueness at this point where it bifurcates into two pieces? This is very nicely discussed in this book on elasticity. Here's a pretty obvious example from classical mechanics. If you have a hill, it doesn't matter so much that I draw on these water puddles, but just imagine some hill and I throw a ball. Can you make the ball go like this, for example, in a figure eight? Well, if you just miss your initial velocity a little bit, you're going to fall off here. So I managed to get this trajectory, but you have to work pretty hard to get even this many times that goes around. So this system is pretty sensitive to initial conditions. In fact, the original example was a mathematician at the Ecole Normale in Paris, studied geodesics of a surface of constant negative curvature, like a double torus, can be given a metric of constant negative curvature, and the geodesics diverge exponentially. So this is very sensitive to initial conditions on this surface of Euler characteristic minus two. Another thing that can happen is you can have a tractor or a repeller. This is called a limit cycle. You come here and you start going like this, but once you start going, you're gonna get stuck here. This is pretty intuitive that you can have a dynamical system that can end up in some kind of thing which is not actually static, but is stationary. It keeps going back around. So here's your typical example of a dynamical system. It's a pendulum. The pendulum state is not completely described by just saying where it is. We would like to also say what the velocity is. And then we can draw a little abstract ellipse like the red one up there. In fact, we can just draw the ellipse where up is momentum and sideways is position. And the point here characterizes the state of the pendulum. So if it's here, for example, it has zero velocity at the turning point. At this point, something happens to the derivative. The derivative of the ellipse, if you view it as a function of y of x, obviously is infinite. So something happens here, something happens here. And we can study these special points pretty easily using this kind of system. Notice here, it's not so obvious where the velocity is. I'll get back to that later. For now, just say abstractly, okay, this is x and this is y. And I have some dynamical system like this. 
It can be characterized by this constants P and Q. And judging from the values of discriminant of this system, you can actually make a nice classification in terms of various kinds of behavior. To get any feeling for this, let's look at some examples. So again, vector field is a system of first order ODs, component ODs that we specify the right hand side that specifies the vector field, and that's our dynamical system. So here's a very simple example, x dot equals x, y dot equals y. Alternatively, I could say my vector field capital X is given in a coordinate basis as x comma y, meaning the right hand side here is x and the right hand side here is y. If I draw this, for example, using the command field plot in maple, I get this plot, whereas this system gives me this plot. Notice that the second system maybe looked a little contrived. It's very simple. It's just z dot is z squared, where z is the complex number x plus i y. And actually you can think of this as being z dot equals z, and this is z dot z squared. And you go from z to z squared by a conformal mapping. So if you know what a conformal mapping is, you can amuse yourself by mapping these two to each other. The physical interpretation of this here, at least if you had the right normalization here, this is something like a point charge. By normalization, I mean that a point charge, the arrows actually get bigger when you get closer to the origin, whereas here they get bigger when they get further away. You can divide by one over some function of the radius, get the same directions of the arrows, but different magnitudes in different places. That's what I mean by this point charge. For the point charge case, the arrows will be bigger close to the origin. A dipole is like having two charges very close to each other. That's this kind of field in electromagnetism. Here's another example, x and then minus y looks like this. And this is another, this version like I had before, except now it's a flipped minus sign here. The origin now repels these arrows. When the arrows come, they go away from the origin. Similarly here, again, we can get this thing by some complex equation where now z bar is complex conjugate. It's called a SATA point. It's unstable because we get close to it, we go away. This is equally unstable. It's a different kind of SATA point. You see that the symmetry here is, there's the fourfold symmetry here, and this look, looks like a fivefold symmetry here. We'll talk more about that. Here's another one. So if z dot is iz, that's this system, and now it goes around. And it's easy to understand because in complex coordinate, multiplication by i is rotation of 90 degrees. So before, if you had something that pointed outwards or inwards, now it's going to be perpendicular to that. So you have this vortex looking thing. And in fact, this is the pendulum because z dot dot is iz dot according to this. And you do it again, you get minus z. So this is a harmonic oscillator, z double dot equals minus z. If the upwards was velocity and the right ways was position, then this is our pendulum. In general, you can classify your system by the eigenvalues of the matrix A on the right hand side. So the real and opposite signs is a saddle point. Complex conjugate is a spiral point where it spirals in. And pure imaginary is a stable point. We'll talk more about that. Another way to characterize it is if you go around in a circle, how does this little arrow rotate? It starts going right, and I go up here, the arrow is pointing up. I go here, there is pointing left. Go here, there is pointing down. And here I come back. So it made a full turn when I went around this circle. If you go back to my other examples, you see that it's not always the same. It's going to make a different number of turns depending on the vector field. So this characterizes the vector field, and this is called the index of the vector field, which for these nice vector fields is an integer. And here's the drawing of the classification. You have these nice pendulum-like things here. You have these funny things over here. So this is classification in P and Q, where P is this and Q is this, given the system we had. As you can find the previous examples in this classification, where the discriminant delta classifies, here's the negative delta, here's positive delta, and delta equals zero is this parabola that really separates these kinds of behaviors. So this diagram is very useful. It's from the Wikipedia page on dynamical systems. Now, this was all in the plane, the phase plane, as it's sometimes called. You could also have this in three dimensions. So you have a vortex in three dimensions, some vector field going around a line. That could be called a line defect or a line vortex. These are very important in fluid mechanics. For example, here's a tornado. I didn't get a good picture, but I was in Texas for the 1997 tornado outbreak around Austin. So there's a theorem in aerodynamics that the lift force of an airfoil has to do with whether there's a line vortex. Some of these vortices can also decay. For example, this Burkers vortex is a kind like that. Now this is just potential flow, as I discussed in another video. In general, we have turbulence. This is a picture of a real airfoil. You can have this von Karman vortex street that I'm showing here um, from the Wikipedia page on turbulence. There's a lot of interesting physics here, obviously. In fact, in condensed matter, vortex anti-vortex annihilation in material science gave a part of the KonMat Nobel Prize in 2016. Here, my former office neighbor, Hans Hansson, is explaining this in terms of donuts versus the Swedish bulle or cinnamon bun. They clearly have different topology, even though there's a little bit of hole here. So this is relevant for these index theorems. Now, what was the physics interpretation? We said that it wasn't completely clear what the mapping was between this dynamical system, x dot ax, and the physics. So here, the right-hand side should be viewed as prescribed. This is just kinematic. We're saying x dot is the velocity in some sense, the definition of velocity. 
You are saying something non-trivial if you say, as we did with potential flow, like around the airfoil, that the vector field is a gradient of potential energy. Something energy like at least, we're setting constants here to one. Contrast dynamics on the potential surface. If you set the mass equal to one, then Newton's law is acceleration equals force. And force, if it's conservative, then the force is minus the gradient of the potential energy. Now this is a second order differential equation, so you get to choose the initial velocity. Unlike in this kind of system, this first order, you can only pick the point. The initial condition was just the value x0 vector. What we're doing here is basically saying, here's the kinematic constraint that the velocity is given by the first derivative. And now we're saying that the acceleration is specified by the force. And the force can, in simple cases, be given by the gradient function of a potential energy. So just imagine this as some scalar function that determines this right-hand side. And together, this is the system we're trying to solve. As soon as we bring in nabla, the gradient, in a t-dependent equation, we're going to be talking about PDEs. So in the title of this video, I didn't specify ODE or PDE, so it depends a little bit. Here is obviously an ODE, but once you start thinking like this, it's a PDE. Phase space has a direct relation to energy. Potential energy could be thought of as a level set. The number of connected components varies. When you drain the well, the water will get stuck in one and two. This is symmetry breaking because before you drain it down here, it would just be one connected component. The surface would be up here. There's an example of this in Moore's theory, and Maxwell, who thought about electromagnetism, also thought about this. Here's Maxwell. Here's his paper from 1870 on hills and dales. We're not going to get into the detail here, but he's basically saying that looking at hills and dales gives you interesting information about topography, and today we would say also topology, and we can learn about vector fields on this surface. Whereas Morse was a mathematician, his level sets were potential energy, but you can think of them as filling this with water, and this shows the level of the water. Morse used calculus of variations to get interesting results in differential topology. In fluid mechanics, a potential flow, here's just a circular cylinder, is something very simple. Even though it's just the flow of dry water, you can still learn some things about wet water. But you can't learn about turbulence. So turbulence like here, for example, Kolmogorov theory from 1941. Mandelbrot talks about turbulence on this nice website. There's a beautiful book by Barenblatt. And my colleague Klaus Ugla has a nice paper on this in self-similarity, like in the Mandelbrot set. If you zoom in, it looks like itself, how that works in general relativity. So I can't help but mention critical phenomena in general relativity, where I have one citation, but no paper. So here's the animation. This is critical collapse of a gravitating skirmion. You see this echoing? That's a critical phenomenon in general relativity. In this case, collapse of gravitating skirmions.